here now, um, I'm, I'm the executive director at the Center for Health Policy and Center for Primary Care and Outcomes Research, and I am introducing our first panel. Um, we're going to have a panel on international um, health, and um, we have colleagues here that are going to kind of expand our view before we before we start narrowing in on, on more of the U.S. healthcare context. We're going to expand our view and um, think about the entire globe. Um, and my three colleagues here who are going to help us do that are Grant Miller, right here, wave, <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, he's an associate professor of medicine at Stanford Medicine and director of the Stanford Center for International Development. He's a core faculty member of our centers uh, and Stanford Health Policy, and he's a senior, mem uh, senior fellow at the Freeman Spugley Institute for International Studies, FSI. And the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, or CEPR. Um, we have acronyms for everything. Um, his primary interests are health economics, development economics, and economic demography, economics across the board. Um, as a health and development economist based at the Stanford um, Medical School, Grant's overarching uh, focus is research and teaching aimed at developing more effective health improvement strategies for developing countries. And many of his research projects are based in rural India um, and China, and Grant is one of the uh, chief proponents on the campus of the interdisciplinary approach to international health. And you'll see how, um, how truly interdisciplinary the entire panel is, um, thankfully to the type of leadership that Grant and others have, have offered here. I'd like to also introduce Marcella Alsan. Wave, <laughs> okay. Um, this will be just, just for this panel. Other panels may not do the waving thing, but. Um, Marcella is an assistant professor of medicine and a core faculty member also at Stanford Health Policy. And um, she is also the only, we believe, the only practicing infectious disease trained doctoral level economist in the United States. Do you think that's true? I think that's true. Um, her research focuses on the relationship between health and socioeconomic disparities over time um, in both the United States and developing countries. And she will be giving us a window into her thinking um, on novel approaches um, with examples um, from this kind of work over the, the vast geographical territory of the U.S. and the rest of the world. Aran Bendavid over here um, is also an infectious diseases physician um, and assistant professor of medicine at Stanford Medicine. Um, he also has a truly interdisciplinary approach. He combines theories and insights from political science, economics, and epidemiology to study the prevention and treatment of infectious diseases in developing countries. Um, Iran is also a disease modeler, and he uses that skill to explore issues of resource allocation um, in low- and middle-income countries with cost-effectiveness analysis. Um, his research projects include impact evaluations of the U.S. Um, assistance program for HIV in Africa and an exploration of the association between drug prices, um, aid, and health outcomes in countries heavily affected by HIV, and you will be treated um, to his way of thinking about improving health in low-income countries. So with that, I'm turning it over to Grant first um, to uh, start us off um, in taking this wider view of the world. Your slides are coming. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so maybe while we're waiting on the slides, I would say a lot of what you're going to hear about today is on the ACA and health reform in the U.S. Uh, this panel is on global health. Uh, speaking for myself personally, I guess I would say part of the reason I work on global health is because the U.S. is just too complicated and hard. Um, so <laughs> I'm glad we have others who are going to take care of that for us today. Um, let's see. It looks like I have to do it myself here. <laughs> well, you can't see the title of my seven minutes with you, so I'll just tell you what it is. Um, like any good academic, I don't believe it's possible to tell you something deep and substantive in five minutes, so I thought I'd at least have a provocative title. So my title is uh, Global Health, Not Giving the People What They Want and Not Knowing How to Give It to Them. Um, we still don't have that up here. Um, 
No, we do haven't. So that is my title. Um, so my understanding uh, for this very brief time is that we had basically two objectives. Uh, one is I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about myself, and the other is I'm supposed to tell you a little bit about what I work on. I thought the first is maybe less interesting. I'd try to get it out of the way in one slide. Um, I'm a health and development economist. I'm based in a medical school. Um, as my daughter tells me every morning, I'm not a real doctor. Um, and so um, this leads to, um, to a bit of a split personality, I might say. I get uh, widely disparate feedback on my work. Um, if I were a real doctor, by the way, I would be calling myself, I would be diagno diagnosing myself with a dissociative identity disorder, I guess would be the proper term for that. Anyway, doctors think that I work on things that are impossibly broad, anything related to global health. Uh, economists think my work is incredibly narrow, only on health. The way I would describe it, since I don't really pay attention to either, I suppose, is that I work on two things. Um, the first is I work on why populations have become healthier in global history. Um, in practice, what that means is anytime there's been a very large change in the health of a population, I'm interested in being there, digging out statistics that are hard to get, rummaging through archives, trying to understand what's happened. Uh, I've worked historically on the United States. Uh, China under Mao, the Russian mortality crisis. I'm working rather intensively on the case of Iran since the Islamic Re Revolution right now. Um, without uh, getting into details, I'll say that uh, a key part of the answer seems to be health-specific technological progress. If you take that assertion as true, then that motivates the second thing that I work on, which is there's certainly scope for um, dramatic, more technological progress in health, but we actually have the ability right now with things that exist, simple technologies that are inexpensive to improve health a lot in middle and low-income countries, and this, uh, this potential is not being realized. So why is that? How can we make programs to distribute health technologies more effective? Um, many of these studies tend to be uh, intervention-oriented studies in the field with government partners international organizations. And I think on this question, there are distinct challenges on the demand side and the supply side. So I'm gonna use my, um, my remaining three minutes, no one's queuing me yet, um, to, to tell you about them. So let me talk a little bit about the demand side. Um, I thought I would start with the preposterous assertion that health choices are actually about more than health. Um, how do I know this? Uh, well, I know this because I like to eat cheeseburgers. Um, so I'm a guy, I work in a medical school, I use a lot of numbers. I can't tell you the exact risk increment for cardiovascular disease that I assume every time that I eat a cheeseburger, but I love to eat cheeseburgers and I do it anyway. I care about health, but I care about other things too, and I don't want health at any price. A corollary of this is that the more an intervention requires behavior change, the harder it is. You can tell me that eating cheeseburgers is bad for me, I'm not gonna stop. You can make it illegal, I'm gonna find a way to eat them anyway. Um, <laughs> this may seem kind of gimmicky, but let me try to be a little more serious about it. It's actually not easy to go out and find uh, estimates of global coverage rates among at-risk populations for various uh, household uh, technologies appropriate for low-income country settings. Um, so Iran and I and an army of students decided we would uh, produce these over the past few years. Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. And so this is showing you cook stoves, a few of those acronyms you may not know, insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, uh, household uh, water treatment technologies, micronutrient, for micronutrient fortification vaccinations. Um, I don't have time to persuade you of it, but I will just suggest to you that disproportionately, the technologies that require little to no behavior change are at the right end of this spectrum, and disproportionately, the technologies that require very regular, maybe even daily, sustained user engagement, substantial behavior change, fall to the left. And I don't have time to persuade you of it, but I don't think that supply explains all of this pattern that you see here. In fact, I think you could argue uh, that looking across the sweep of history that many of the most successful large-scale population health improvement campaigns and, and uh, initiatives have actually not focused on changing individual health behavior at all. Instead, they've focused on things like modifying environments. So these are things that I've worked on, uh, municipal water system disinfection, uh, sanitation being the complement of that, outdoor DDT spraying for mosquito-borne diseases, vaccinations, micronutrient fortification. I can take my kids to the grocery store. I can buy them a box of Fruit Loops. My wife will surely kill me. Um, my kids will get a lot of garbage, but they'll also get essential vitamins and minerals. 
Um, and they'll be getting those things that are healthy for them and doing what they otherwise want to do. Okay, so um, this is really motivated. Uh, one of two things I'm gonna tell you about in my last couple of minutes. Uh, the first is a project I have right now with a state government in India, the government of Tamil Nadu. Um, so micronutrient deficiency rates in India are abysmally high. Uh, hovering around 70% of kids under five are anemic. It's largely suspected to be due to iron deficiency. And the way that India tries to deal with this problem is by getting people en masse all the time everywhere to swallow vitamins in daycare centers, in schools. Um, needless to say, it hasn't worked very well. I think it's difficult to argue that any part of the world that doesn't have micronutrient deficiencies has successfully gotten there by getting people to swallow vitamins all the time, everywhere uh, throughout their lives. Um, so what we're doing with the government of Tamil Nadu is we're studying the introduction of uh, fortification of rice into something called the public distribution system. This is a system that delivers a, a fixed amount of rice to every household statewide, 80 million people every month. Um, and we're going to test together with the government how well this works. And we're not only going to test that, but we're going to use this as an opportunity to quantify the true costs of behavior change. Um, the findings are not in yet, so I'm not going to tell you about that. Um, I'm starting to see stop, so I'm going to conclude by saying this. Um, on the supply side, I would love to talk to you about misaligned incentives that range from on high at the level of political incentives to on low the level of individual health worker incentives. I've done a lot of work in the field with RCTs trying to redesign performance pay interventions in a way that's theoretically informed and might work better. I guess what I would say in general is that I think you can make things somewhat better. Um, these, these types of approaches can be effective in low income settings, but it's not at all a panacea. I would suggest to you that something we might consider doing is instead looking to maybe surprising successes that are out there for us to learn lessons from. And the one that I'm con gonna conclude in telling you about is kind of a homegrown example here. Um, early 2000s, India, there was no 911 ambulance service that existed in the country. Um, the national government allowed state governments to enter into exclusive contracts with private not-for-profit organizations to, to provide these services statewide. GBK EMRI uh, is one organization and now serves more than half of the Indian population, about 700 million people. Um, in cooperation with people here in Stanford Emergency Medicine who helped with designing protocols um, and training materials um, has now scaled up quite a bit. There has never been a quantitative study of GVK EMRI's population health impact. Last week we published a paper um, which suggests it's actually been quite substantial and impressive. So in, in areas where it started working first, reductions in neonatal mortality upwards of 10%. How is this accomplished? I have no idea. Ex ante, if you told me that this was gonna happen in India, I would have told you it's never gonna work. Something happened and learning what's in the secret sauce I think offers a lot of insight uh, in cases like this as well for uh, how, to, uh, how to handle supply side challenges in global health. So I think I'm egregiously over time and I'll stop with that. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see go next. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Doug and Lauren, and, and thanks, Kathy. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Marcella Alshan. I'll be talking to you about um, some of my research, which is uh, on history, health, and development. So as before I get into the meat of things, I would have a professional disclaimer. I am an infectious disease trained physician economist. And um, so I, I have this natural inclination to think that the history is important. I mean, history is so important to clinicians that we actually have several different types of history. We have past medical, past social, OB-GYN, et cetera. And as an infectious disease clinician, sometimes we're so good at histories that we actually get consulted for chart biopsies. Really highly remunerated activity, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> But why are infectious disease physicians so obsessed with history? Well, it's really hard um, to know what a, a person could have if we don't know what they were exposed to, and then we can line that up with incubation periods and routes of transmission, and that helps to put some things higher and some things lower up on our differential. 
So with that in mind, um, what are the broader linkages between history, health, and development? Well, the first order question in development economics is trying to understand why some populations are rich and why some are poor. And just um, borrowing uh, from the infectious disease training, we can start with the question, well, what were those populations exposed to? And kind of thinking uh, akin to, to Dean Miner's approach to precision health, you know, trying to understand the social and environmental exposures that might have um, led some people to, to kind of end up in different parts of the distribution. So I have a little slide, I call it the economics of exposures, but again, you could switch out the title for precision health potentially. And although infectious disease is kind of narrowly focused on the rectangles of exposure and infection, the tools of econo economics and econometrics help us to broaden that and get to the circles of, of asking why are some people exposed in the first place, and then looking further downstream to ask what are the distributional consequences of that um, for their economic outcomes as well as their health outcomes. All right, with that framework in mind, I wanted to take you to a couple empirical examples. Now, I am in the right session. <laughs> this is international health, but I'm interested in health disparities, and I feel like we don't necessarily need to go outside our own borders to find examples of health disparities. I was really interested, building off Grant's presentation, on why there is low uptake for some things that have high returns, and I wanted to understand the role of mistrust on healthcare demand. So I actually took, um, I looked at the historical context. Many in the room know about the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. If you don't know, that's the official title of it, and the, the, the salient parts are the three pieces in the title itself. It was a study performed in Tuskegee, Alabama. There were uh, individuals who would have syphilis and they were not to be treated, and it specifically targeted um, African-American men in the South, mostly who were illiterate sharecroppers. Well, a few more details that are important for the empirical work. These men were actively prevented from getting highly effective treatment known as penicillin. Instead, they were offered routine checkups, hot meals, burial payments, and told euphemistically that they had bad blood. And this study went on for four decades and uh, is sort of exhibit A of uh, medical um, ethics of what not to do. So finally, the study was halted when a whistleblower leaked the story to the Associated Press. And again, the study in a slide, you can see this cartoon showing these men marching to the morgue, and it says, secret Tuskegee study, free autopsy, free burial, plus a $100 bonus. So along with my colleague, Marianne Wanamaker, we hypothesized that this disclosure event engendered mistrust and that this mistrust would be particularly salient for individuals who most nearly identified with those poor study subjects, particularly older African-American men living in the South. And we wanted to then study how did that affect their health-seeking behavior and how did it actually affect um, real health outcomes. And so again, we were able to use the tools of econometrics, what's known as a triple difference, to test this hypothesis. And so essentially what I'm going to show you next is a graph, and the triple difference is three differences. The first difference is comparing black men to either black women or to white men, that's the first difference, before versus after 1972 when the story broke in the AP, that's the second difference in places near versus far from Tuskegee, Alabama. Again, our idea is that individuals who are geographically, culturally, and demographically closer to the study subjects would be more affected. And what we're showing you here is an event study. And so we can see that these differences are relatively flat between black and white men um, prior to the disclosure event. But then once the study is disclosed, you can see there's um, a dramatic jump down in health behaviors. This is in particular going to see the doctor, the number of visits you had in the last month, um, which is particularly prominent um, after the disclosure event and continues for several years out. I could show you the same graph for mortality outcomes, but instead I wanted to just show you the raw data. And so what I'm plotting here is over time, this is from the late 1960s to the mid-1980s, differences in the black-white male mortality rates, that's the blue line, and differences in the, in the um, black-white female mortality rate. That's the red line. And what we can see is if we're talking about infants, and this has been what's been well studied, particularly in the 
economics literature is, is dramatic convergence, a very good news type of story. And we know some of the factors, some of the social factors that were leading to that convergence, Medicare, Medicaid for infants, the desegregation of hospitals, et cetera, enfranchisement. Um, and so we see these dramatic decreases in disparities and convergence going on for both infants and children, and even for older women, black women compared to white women. But after 1972, we see divergence, particularly for older black men, and it comes a little bit more lagged for, for men in the 60s to 70-year-old range, but part of our um, econ econometric analysis is unpacking that and ascribing some of that to the disclosure and the health behaviors we showed you on the last slide. One more slide. Okay, um, the next slide was going to be to show you just a, another example of the work that I had done, which was on the Tetsai fly, and um, at the same type of level showing how the historical exposure to African trypanosomiasis had affected real health outcomes. But in conclusion, um, just to wrap up, the point that I was trying to make is that history and health are important whether we're thinking about it as clinicians or as development economists, knowing what people are exposed to and thinking about how that can affect the distribution of their outcomes today, um, I think is something that we're all uh, interested in. So thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Iran Bin David. I'm also a, an infectious disease uh, doctor. There's a, an epidemic of those around here. Um, and, um, and I'd like to talk to you a, a little bit about my uh, perspective and some of my work on, uh, on health policy uh, relating to low-income countries. Um, this is uh, a guy by the name of Mario Balotelli. He's a, a, a talented and, and rambunctious uh, Italian striker with a, a signature undershirt uh, that he lets the world see after scoring. Um, well, Super Mario, as uh, he's uh, well known, uh, is certainly a talented striker, but part of the reason why he's able to score uh, is because he plays for an excellent team with excellent fullbacks and excellent midfields um, who make uh, surgical strikes uh, that put Mario in excellent positions uh, to score. And um, uh, I think a little bit of the health policy and especially the global health policy research in a somewhat similar way that success uh, and health of individuals across the globe uh, is heavily influenced by uh, their team, their ho the households in which they grow, uh, the communities where they live, uh, their country's uh, uh, policies, uh, and the impacts of an increasingly uh, uh, interconnected world. Um, uh, to bring this uh, back to uh, uh, the soccer example, uh, Mario Balotelli uh, uh, has been doing great, uh, but I wonder what his uh, undershirt would have been uh, saying if his Manchester, Manchester, City, Manchester City team uh, was uh, swapped by the Palo Alto AYSO. <laughs> Um, and one of the, one of the, the policy uh, uh, areas that I study is uh, the foreign aid to the health sector. Uh, for the foreign aid to the health sector has been uh, a bull market uh, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, uh, jumping uh, over threefold between the early 1990s until 2010. Um, the greatest uh, increase in, uh, in donations uh, for, uh, to the health sector specifically has come from the United States. And within the United States, the greatest increase uh, has been towards HIV. HIV has been the biggest uh, single program. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief history of the U.S. aid for HIV, because uh, uh, that has been a, an area of, of uh, interest and, and study for me. Um, uh, really, things uh, converged in 2003 when uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, political uh, goodwill and, and social activism uh, really uh, uh, had uh, sort of formed the right time to uh, start what was called at the time the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, uh, a, 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 a new money that was dedicated from the United States uh, for HIV uh, was uh, was uh, uh, has gone from zero uh, to nearly five billion dollars a year uh, in, uh, by, in, within the first five years, and by now, uh, over 13 years of uh, of the uh, program's operation, has given out nearly 70 billion dollars. 
Um, I had been very interested in, in this program in part because uh, there is no, uh, uh, no in-home or in-house evaluation uh, for, uh, for all this new money that was uh, 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 dedicated. One of the unique features of uh, PEPFAR was the fact that uh, it focused on uh, 15 countries, 12 of whom in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where uh, all of this support was really uh, uh, committed. And uh, what, uh, in, as uh, part of the work that I've done with Grant and with Jay, uh, I have, uh, I have uh, uh, pretended that, that uh, this uh, PEPFAR was uh, almost, think of it as almost as a, as a, as a, as a trial, uh, where the countries where the money was, uh, was committed um, was, uh, were the, the intervention countries and uh, neighboring and uh, similarly uh, affected countries were the control uh, countries. Um, and this is what we've noticed, is that uh, the, the, the mortality rate for the most heavily affected population by HIV, the, the, the middle-aged adults um, uh, population, was, uh, they, they were at, at pretty high levels, both, uh, both of the, the focus countries as well as uh, the neighboring countries. Um, uh, but that trend, trend has, uh, has really changed dramatically uh, after the implementation of, uh, of PEPFAR. Um, and this was an example where a lot of this uh, uh, foreign aid uh, has, uh, has really uh, uh, had a substantial and meaningful impact. Um, but, uh, but this wasn't always the case. And so this is uh, one of the, the less um, uh, agreeable uh, parts of, uh, of, of PEPFAR, or one of the parts that were sort of most controversial, uh, was the fact that a third of all prevention money for PEPFAR was uh, earmarked for abstinence and, um, and faithfulness um, uh, 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 programs. Okay, so there the was uh, a third of all the prevention funds were supposed to go uh, for education, for abstinence, and prevention, uh, and and uh, and faithfulness. Uh, and uh, and we uh, we wanted to examine whether uh, whether the, these uh, whether these programs have had a change on sexual behavior. The the thought was that uh, changing uh, these sexual risk behaviors would uh, would be an effective HIV prevention program. Uh, and we looked at things like. Uh, the number of sexual partners, uh, and we found no change in the number of sexual partners with all of this funding. By this is uh, over over one and a half billion dollars that were dedicated to this, um, and we looked at uh, things like the age of uh, first sexual intercourse, and we found no age, uh, no change in the age of uh, sexual debut, and we looked at uh, the uh, rate of teen pregnancy, and we found no change in the rate of uh, teen pregnancy. Uh, in in a, a bit of uh, satisfying uh, policy impact. Uh, uh, this work was uh, then incorporated into the UNH's decision to uh, uh, remove abstinence and faithfulness education as an effective uh, uh, approach to uh, HIV prevention uh, and, uh, and was adopted by PEPFAR uh, in, uh, in agreeing to um, uh, essentially do away uh, with, uh, with uh, this, uh, th this program. Um, we remain asking a lot of uh, important questions uh, uh, on the global health policy, uh, especially with, uh, with relates to, uh, to the, the uh, health aid. Um, uh, are there unintended harms to health aid? And there's are reasonable arguments that, uh, that if you're, even if uh, money is being uh, put to no good use, uh, that is a potential unintended harm uh, of health aid. Um, how do we get the best value for the money? Uh, even though we saw that, uh, that nearly $20 billion uh, were associated with meaningful uh, reductions in mortality, is this good value? Is this the best thing we can do uh, with these resources? Um, how do we target the poorest? Uh, uh, it, are, we, uh, are we really reaching the populations that are most in need uh, of, uh, of foreign assistance? And how do we pr promote the sustainability uh, of health aid? Um, uh, if, uh, if we're giving uh, a lot of resources from here, how, does this uh, mean that, uh, that uh, the, the countries are going to uh, spend their own resources uh, as well so as to make it uh, sustainable over the long term. Um, and these are the kinds of exciting questions, the kind of exciting topics that, uh, that we're still doing here and working a lot on here at the Center for Health Policy. Uh, and with this, I'd like to thank you.